Okay, we have a few people still uh, joining, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. And if you have any questions, you can chat with me. This is a chat screen that you can pull up and you can send me a little chat message if you want. Most of you I, I talked to yesterday, and uh, I'm thrilled that you actually made it to the webinar. It's wonderful. So anytime you have any questions, the first thing I'd like to do is ask uh, David or Cynthia, could you let me know if you can hear me just fine, if I need to adjust the volume or anything, or is it pretty good? So that's one thing I'd like to know. And uh, we'll just go ahead and, and get started. So the first thing we want to talk about, and the, this whole point of this webinar, and here's my answer. Yes, you can hear. Thank you. And so the whole point of this webinar is we see all these horrible things happening and we want to be able to do something to prevent them from happening. It's like the famous line in Deja Vu, the movie with Denzel Washington, where he says, you know, all my life I've been going to places and trying to figure out, you know, what happened, something horrible happens. And he said, just for once, I'd like to get in front of something and find out what I can do to stop something horrible from happening. And that's what we're doing. And of course, that's been uh, my mantra all the time. But Athena, that I'm working with on this webinar series, they also, that's their, their motto is we save lives. And that's it. They, and that's what I want to do, too. I want to save lives and make life easier for everybody in terrible times. So let's go to our next screen. So this is me. So I've been doing this for a really long time. I've done. Uh, assessments, risk assessments, and, and ROI calculations, return on investment, to justify the cost of security controls. So we're going to go in a little bit on that and look at what those cost features are. But again, we just want to, I want to just take you through real quickly some of the events that have happened lately. I don't know if you've seen them all. I'm sure you saw the summary, summary of the terrorism threat to the United States. It came out on June 7th. And I have a link for you if you want it. It's right here. And it's about a three page bulletin. And what I would recommend that you do if you were asking me, and, and sometimes somebody does ask me something, uh, I would just copy this and send it to everybody and say, this came out from the, the Department of Homeland Security and it involves terrorism. And we wanted you to read it and be aware of it and just send it out to them. And that's the link. And that'll be, that'd be a good thing to do is to people understand what's going on here. The other thing, there a lot of things happened in June. So the other thing that happened is the active shooter incidents in the United States in, uh, in 2021 started too. And they do the summary every year of what happened the previous year. So this is 2021 compared to 2020. And so the, I'm just gonna go over it real briefly so you can see the changes. So in 2020 we had, which was a bad year, we had 40 incidents and we had, uh, 19, 19 states. In 2021, we had 61 incidents in 30 states. In casualties, we had 164 in 2020 with 30 people killed, 126 wounded. In 2021, we had 243 killed. I'm sorry, 243 casualties, 103 killed, and 140 wounded. The law officers killed was very low. The officers wounded 11 in 2020 and five in 2021, the ones that incidents that met the FBI definition of a mass killing, which is that four or more people are killed. We had five in 2020, we had 12 in 2021. Incidents where law enforcement engaged the shooters, eight in 2020, 17 in 2021. The shooters, we had 42 shooters in, in 2020, and uh, three of them were female and four of them were quote unspecified. And in 2021, we had 61, 60 of them were male, one was a female. Again, use of body armor, one in 2020, two in 2021. Uh, shooters who committed suicide, seven in 2020 and 11 in 2021. And so one of the th trends that I have researched and looked at myself is that people who commit suicide are older people. So when you're 60, 70 years old and doing an active shooter, and creating one and shooting people, usually they, they kill themselves after. It's the young people who are in their 20s and younger that usually uh, turn themselves into law enforcement. They don't want to be shot and they don't want to die. So the shooters that were killed by law enforcement, we had four in 2020, we had 14 in 2021. 
shoot shooters killed by citizens walking by we had two in 2020 and four in 2021 and the shooters who were apprehended by law enforcement we had 24 in 2020 we had 30 in 2021 and again there's still a couple that are at large so that just shows you the difference in one year it's gotten worse and it's probably going to get worse again so we see that these shootings and violence in healthcare are increasing we can see that especially in june for some reason the first weeks of june have just been brutal and so we have to do something to slow this down you know i don't think and i think most people think it's not acceptable to have this high level of of people being at, shot when they're not even nobody even knows who they are so i think that's uh is something we need to look at. So uh, how common is it to have, they said it's more common, more dangerous to be working in healthcare than working up on a high rise building. And physicians are getting involved now too. They are signing on to these bills that are going around. Uh, a lot of states have passed uh, rules for felonies, a, fel a new law that makes it a felony to, to hurt a, a healthcare worker. And a lot of the states have signed on. I think way more than half now have signed on. And California is actually going to coming up with a standard that they want to be a national standard too. That they're gonna they're hopefully going to have all the states adopt it. So these are just some of the latest ones. This was a Tulsa shooting. We're going to talk about that. This is where the guy he had a his name last name was Lewis fatally shot two orthopedic doctors, a medical receptionist and a bystander and then himself. And this was in a medical building on the St. Francis campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He, he looked for and targeted Dr. Preston Phillips, a surgeon who operated on him because he said he still had pain when he was released from the hospital on May 24th. And at two o'clock that day, same day, he went and purchased an AR style rifle from a local gun store and he took it to the hospital later, along with a 40 caliber Smith and Wesson semi-automatic handgun that he'd bought from a pawn shop. And this is the, the outside the Natalie Medical Building. And so he said that he was still in pain. The doctor was 59 years old. They found him after the shooting. He was dead in the second floor exam room. He also, he also shot the second orthopedic doctor. And Tulsa was the 233rd mass shooting of 2022. Uh, Phillips was an orthopedic surgeon. He was a good guy, very well educated. They said he was very kind. So what happens, and I can go through a million of these, but I don't want to. What I want to do is say, okay, what could we have done that prevented something horrible from happening? So in this case, what could we have done that would prevent this from happening? And I'm going to start at the bottom because you can see what happens. If they'd had a faster police response, would, would that have helped? No, because the police were there between like in three minutes. Uh, number five, going from top to bottom, if we changed our policies and procedures, would that have made a difference? And the you know to report or whatever, I don't think so. Having a security officer present, would that have helped? Maybe, maybe if they were armed, but maybe not. Uh, how about having a live receptionist? Well, when the guy entered the building, there was a live receptionist and he killed her. She was the first person he killed. How about panic alarms? What, what do you do when you have a panic alarm and you hit it and nothing happens because it's later in the day, people have gone home or it's a shift change for security officers if they even have any. And again, what about having people be screened for concealed weapons when they enter the building? That, I think, is the only thing that could have prevented this. And it's because A is for access control. So if you don't have some kind of screening, you don't have, you, know, you can't guarantee that your staff and the patients are safe inside your building or the students or the teachers or anybody. You can't make, you can't prevent anything from happening unless you do screening of people. If you let them in, they're going to have weapons with them. In fact, the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, he what they were going to put in some screening detection, and they put it in in three of their clinics, three of their, uh, some of them were clinics, some were hospitals, in nor northern Ohio. And what happened? They found forty thousand weapons in the first month that they had missed because they hadn't screened prior to that. Once they started screening, they found guns, they found knives, they found everything. And I think most of you probably would have the same. Uh, the same situation. I just wonder how many people here 
uh, maybe you can write me separately or just send me a note later how many people have some kind of, of concealed weapons screening right now. We're going to talk about that because, again, it's such, such an important control. This happened uh, the day after or maybe even the same day as the Tulsa thing. This was in Encino Hospital Medical Center, which is in Los Angeles, California. And this is a guy who, who walked in off the street. In fact, he walked out of his car, which he left running in the middle of the street. And he had his dog with him on a leash and he took him his dog in the medical building. He left his car in the middle of the street, ran in the medical building with the dog, barricaded himself in the emergency room for four hours. They sent a SWAT team out to, out to negotiate with him. And that was a total waste. He went up and stabbed a doctor and also two nurses inside the hospital and remained in the room for hours. Uh, and they said that they thought he might have been high because of the, the way he looked and he came in and he wanted anti-anxiety drugs. He had a record. He'd been arrested the previous year for battery of a police officer and resisting arrest. An ultrasound technician said he saw the man who had the dog with him and looked like he was very nervous. He was drenched in sweat. And uh, after the hospital issued a triage code, he saw a doctor and nurse who had been stabbed. That's what the witness said. Doctor looked, she, she was in pain. There was a lot of blood. It looked like he got her in the abdomen. So that was another really bad one. This was yesterday. They, this is a, a woman that they got on a mental health hold in, in Conroy, Texas, which is outside of Houston. And she was strapped down to a gurney. She was for a, a mental health evaluation. Brought her in on a gurney and she pulled out a gun and started shooting. So in, in this case, if you'd had a policy and procedure in place that would have said, should always check the person be, coming into the hospital to see if they have a weapon. Obviously they didn't do that there. She, they met, and I just can't understand either. And I'm sure you can't either, how they could strap her down to a gurney, her legs and, and she still allow her to have, to have a gun in, in her pants and her waistband, whatever and start shooting. She fired off two shots before the emergency medical personnel saved the day by disarming her. And he made it a lot better. It could have been a horrible, horrible situation. And again, she was there to maintain a, to get a mental health evaluation. They had, she had an emergent, they had an emergency detention order from the Harris County Sheriff's Office. And she was just immediately disarmed, which saved a lot of lives. And it was an HCA hospital, which is, and the, she was charged uh, Glendar Johnson Jackson, 65, arrested and charged with one count of fatal felony and one misdemeanor of unlawfully carrying weapons in a prohibited location, which is why you need to have that sign on all your windows and no weapon sign outside your windows. And that marks it as a, as a, a location, a prohibited location, and it's easier to be able to arrest them for not paying attention to that sign. So these are, those are just some of the things that happened in the last two days. Here's the 2021 Healthcare Crime Survey that the IAHHS, which is the International Association of Hospital Safety and Security People, that they had their conference in Reno. And uh, I went to that conference and was there the whole time. Maybe I met you there. And this is research that they had their foundation do and looked at the increase in these kind of crimes. So if violent crimes in hospitals, this is people, number of people per hundred beds, it started going up in 2012. They only had one. 2013, they had uh, 2.5. 2014, they had 2.8. And then it dropped back down to 0.9 and then built to one, then 1 1.4, then 1 1.4, and then up to 1.7 per 100 beds for violent crimes in hospitals. For simple assaults, and this is again the same time period, 2012 to 2020, you can see how much higher they are. So it started here at uh, 10.7. And then here, this is, I think, when the new uh, final, uh, final rule on emergency preparedness was introduced, actually, in 2013, 14. And then uh, here it goes back up again to 14.2 assaults per 100 beds. So again, you can just see the, the way that the trend's going here is not good. And again, the safety, they talk about them like security issues. But if you say security to somebody, if, if you ask if you, they work, if you work in security and you say yes, they think you're a guard walking around without a gun, telling people what to do all the time. Same thing with safety. You know, they think that you're measuring the load on the AC. 
But again, what's happened now with the new law for hospitals, the CMS final rule on emergency preparedness, a federal law, is now it's all about compliance and liability because I'll point out to you how much compliance costs organization and how they prove that they're liable for doing things. And once that once that they rule or a federal federal agency charges you with creating a, a situation where something bad could happen, then you're going to be sued for wrongful death. So that's why the huge uh, $800 million wrongful death lawsuit, class action lawsuit happened after Las Vegas. So so many people were shot, injured, and so many people died. So again, it all traces back to this law here, the final rule on emergency preparedness. And that's for that's for seven, not just hospitals, but 17 different kinds of healthcare organizations, uh, federally qualified health centers, dialysis centers that we have one at my little local supermarket here. They have uh, hospices, hospice care. They have rural hospitals. They have acute care hospitals. They have long-term care, intermediate care. All these have to comply with the same rule. OSHA general, general duty clause, that requires, that applies to every single lawyer in the United States. And it requires employers to maintain a safe environment free of recognized threats. And now there's a new federal standard coming out for workplace violence that OSHA has created. And it comes right out of these guidelines for preventing workplace violence in healthcare and social service work. And this came out in 2013, the same right after the other law came out, the final rule on emergency preparedness. And this, this is the title of this one is OSHA 3148. You could see it down if it wasn't for the line there. And so this is a House bill. It got passed by the House in April of uh, 2021. And just now, it would be a week ago, the Senate passed the bill too. Tammy Baldwin, the senator from Wisconsin, introduced it, and uh, it passed the Senate. So the legislation has major support from nurses, federal requirements, uh, all sorts of healthcare workers and everything. So the whole, now we know what the threat environment is and we know what the recognized threats are. And the recognized threats are somebody walking in off the street and shooting healthcare workers or, st or students or teachers or people who work in an Amazon distribution center has already happened or in a clinic or anywhere else. So we wanna say, what can we do to prevent these things happening? And just by walking through them, you can see that again, the A is for access control. If you allow people to come in with undeclared weapons into your facility, you know, I mean, if you are a very gun heavy state and you want them to leave their weapon at the lobby, then you can do that. And they can lock it up with their driver's license and they get it back when they leave. And a lot of people are going just for general personnel screening to make sure somebody's not a, a threat like a pedophile or something or a sex uh, convicted sex offender that they do keep your driver's license at the front desk until when you come in to see your mother who might be in intensive care or something. And then when you leave, you know, you get it back along with your driver's license. But here we're talking about screening for concealed weapons. So this is different than going and signing a piece of paper and putting down that you arrived at, at 4.05 and you left at 5.30. This is screening for the weapons. And there's a new, this company, Athena Security, has this new program called Entryway. And what it does is it screens for the concealed weapons. It doesn't alarm if you're, cell, you're carrying your cell phone. It doesn't alarm off your belt buckle. It doesn't alarm off anything. It just automatically screens for certain com combinations of metal. And there's a computer panel there. So when it sees it, it automatically notifies the 500 people you've designated, which could be the entire population, healthcare staff population. It could be po local police, could be the sheriff's department could be the head of your contract security, any of those people. Could be the administrator, the vice president, the COO, director of facilities, all these things. Automatically notifies everybody so that you can get that concealed weapon before it gets into the facility. So I'll give you another example. And this happened last summer with a little, uh, a good size ambulatory surgery center where they do eye surgery, uh, nearsightedness, lace surgery and things like that. So the guy is in the operating room. He's wearing his pants. They don't take their pants off. They just wear a jacket, like a, a dressing gown over them. So he's in there being operated on. And all of a sudden, there's a loud bang. And a gun falls out of his pocket onto the floor. 
And of course, all the ner- everybody, the nurses, doctors ran out of the room. So, you know, what happened, that's what happens when you don't screen for weapons automatically before they enter the building. If they enter the building with a concealed weapon, I can tell you it's going to probably have a bad result. There's a reason why they carried their gun into the, they didn't lock it in the glove compartment on the way in. And that's why I think the, the ease of use and also the low cost of being able to, to screen for these concealed weapons without, nobody has to stop walking. They can just walk right through as fast as they want. Only, it's only going to grab them if there's a concealed weapon. We look at also at the policies and procedures that you have in place. And one of the policies and procedures should be that you have to be screened before you come into the facility. And certainly you'd have a secondary screening before you go into the, emer- the operating room or the emergency department. And we had one in uh, Tennessee where the doctor, they allowed the doctor had a heart attack. He, allowed, he was allowed to, because he was a doctor, right? He got take his backpack with him up to the floor where they admitted him to the hospital. And then the phlebotomist came in to do a blood draw on him. And he had a 12 inch Bowie knife in his backpack that he took out and stabbed her with because he thought she was taking too long, too clumsy to, to draw his blood. There are other things people recommend, you know, they have a lot in schools, especially about little devices that you can put on a door to secure the door so it can't be pulled open from the outside. Some people think that all the windows on the lower floor, the first floor of any th- place that could have some, one of these incidents should have bulletproof, bullet resistant glass, bulletproof glass. And again, we have to go back and look at these risk alerts and these threats that come up and what we've seen. And I've never seen one where they shot out the window because it's unreasonable that somebody would shoot out the window and then climb across the window and then go into the, go into the facility. It never happens. Just like it never happens if they sneak in in the middle of the night. They always come in at like 11 o'clock in the morning. So Again, the secured door and windows is a different thing, but it's not going to keep the weapons out of your facility. And if you have concealed weapons in there, somebody's going to use them. So another way to look at it is to do how, how to do the security required assessment required by CMS for every one of these 17 healthcare types required by schools. Almost every school in every state now has to have an assessment done every year. And OSHA also requires a workplace violence assessment every single year on every single facility. So there's three different requirements for work assessments. And the assessment is where you analyze the threats. Hang on, I'm going to close this door. zoo here the zoo here is not not cooperating so the next thing is to hear something say something sort of like the department of homeland security see something say something it's like hear something so if somebody tells you that she's comes in with a black eye somebody you work with and says that you know they had a they their wife came in and told them that uh, she wanted a divorce and they hit her and he hit her she hit him or whatever You know, that needs to be reported to it needs to be is a policy and procedure needs to be reported to HR or reported to employee the EAP program. But basically, that that's another way to avoid some of these things happening by having these people who are at risk of acting out violent behavior, because something happened in their personal life to manage that and call them up and say, hey, come in for a meeting, come talk to us about it. Do you need anything? Do you need any help? Do you need a can we help you get a restraining order? Those kind of things. Those are the things that uh, it makes a big difference with. And also monitoring just your local social media to see if somebody says, as many of these people do, I wanna, I'm want i going in with a gun tomorrow to shoot up my class. That happens all the time too. So again.
read about the FBI mass shooting protocol, of course, uh, Uvalde police response was horrific. There was no police response. It reminds me, I live in Parkland, by the way. I live half a mile from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. So I drive by it or walk by it every single day and I see it. And I remember what happened because I was here that day. And we had about 75 emergency vehicles. In fact, I had stopped at Target on the way back from Miami. And the, I saw the vehicles going up the major roads, I mean, really loud, ambulances, emergency response, everything, police, cars, everything heading up there. And by an half an hour into the situation, they had uh, representatives from probably 60 different news organizations that already set up satellite disks and umbrellas and everything around the perimeter of the school. That's how fast the whole thing happened. And... Again, there were failures at every single point. Number one, they didn't know where the shooter was. They hadn't identified him. So they drove the, the security resource, the school's resource officer. He drove right by the shooter because he was out for lunch, came back and didn't even know he was there. Police, of course, the worst part was they waited more than an hour to head into the classroom while the gunman was still inside shooting people. The chief of police, of school police, showed up without his radio and stopped treating the incident as an active shooter situation and just called it a ballistic in, uh, situation, which is, means absolutely nothing. But again, they, we, we teach also, you can take a class of how to, what to do if there is an active shooter. But this is worse than that because there were, there were 17 kids killed and there were seven, 19 kids killed, and there were 19 police officers right outside the rooms, the classrooms where they were being shot. By, by, by treating it the way that they did, not allowing the police to go in initially, they also kept out all the first responders, so half of the kids didn't have to die. They bled out because nobody stopped the bleeding. And there's also a really good program called Stop the Bleed that you can have your staff go to. If you're not a hospital and you're not already trained, that will teach you how to stop a bullet. One way to do is uh, a tampon, believe it or not. A little small tampon, which is really just a little piece of compressed cotton. And it's sterile because it's wrapped in sealed. It's sealed in plastic. So if you're in a situation and actually Navy SEALs and, and FBI agents and some sheriff's department people carry these in their, in their briefcase or in their pocket for these situations, because you can take that little thin, tiny piece of compressed cotton and it'll fit right into the, the hole that the bullet hole makes. And then it'll expand, right? Because it absorbs the blood and it puts pressure on the artery. So it actually stops the bleed. And I, whenever I think about it, I think about the Pulse nightclub shooting and I'm sure in the ladies room there, they had probably two Tampex dispensing containers and they were ha having they couldn't keep up with the people who were bleeding they couldn't stop the bleeding if they had even known this they could have taken it, it ripped open those machines and and been able to stop the bleeding at least half the people who were injured that day and killed but uh in fact when i do training i hand out these little tampons to people and they're usually real embarrassed and make a lot of jokes about them but i say just keep them in your car keep them in your desk keep them in your briefcase and then you'll be prepared. You know, that's part of emergency preparedness. So the other thing that is happens for hospitals and schools, it, it can't happen here attitude. And we saw them on, on, on the Uvalde shooting. You know, what they were saying was, we have such a small town, everybody knows everybody. So it could, nothing like this could ever happen here. And as soon as you have the mindset that it can't happen here, you leave yourself wide open to not know what to do when it does happen here. So again, didn't update the policies and procedures. I've been to places where I look at their policies and procedures, 25 years old, no social media investigations, even after the guy killed, hang, hang on for one second, I'm sorry. I'm on a webinar, I'll call you back is uh, no warning after the, he shot his grandmother and in the face, people even who were there didn't call the police. Uh, commander on the scene didn't get notified that the kids were calling on their cell phones and, and asking the, the dispatcher to send the police. The police were, were five feet away, right outside their door. Again, not allowing the first responders in, no accountability. So this is not something that we wanna do. Again, this is gonna have a lot of repercussions, but I wanna get on to my, uh, my return on investment. 
So this is a Buffalo shooting, not classified as terrorism, no access control, a racism issue. And the worst part, now that they're finding out, now that they've all been, uh, the shooter's been listed as a terrorist incident now, uh, six people had advanced knowledge of what was going on because the guy had his own uh, website, social media site, where he was telling everybody what he was going to do, that he was going to going to find a place with a lot of black people and he was going to go there and kill them. Told everybody that when he got there, he actually went to his site and gave him a 30 minute advance notice that he was about to go in and start shooting and killing people. And those six people on his list, including the two retired FBI agents, did not notify anybody. They didn't do anything. And again, of course, it was a supermarket. They didn't have access control. They had no uh, response plan, active shooter plan. But again, there's going to be some, some hearings about this if the retired federal employees who'd taken an oath knew about this plan in advance and didn't call law enforcement. Then we have our church. We always have a couple of churches on our webinars, uh, Geneva Presbyterian Church shooting. This was a church full of Taiwanese residents and in Los Angeles in Orange County. Again, they had absolutely no access control. And the shooter know, know this, knew this, so he brought super glue. He glued the church door shut before he went in and started shooting. He nailed the door shut after he glued them, and then he changed he chained the church doors with a padlock. And the shooter shot 10 senior citizens from age 75 to 90. He started shooting. A doctor who had taken his mother to church that morning picked up a chair and hit the guy over the head. That stopped him from killing all these people. And uh, the doctor was killed by the shooter who had his gun drawn and he was Chinese and he felt like that these the Taiwanese people were being disloyal to China and that's why he drove three hours to kill them. So again, excess control. So again, we have these big fines that are coming out. We doctors have become targets, especially for uh, violence if they refuse to provide pain meds for their patients or not enough pain meds or not strong enough pain meds. And so we have this, we have about a dozen of these cases where they go into a clinic or a, a, a urgent care center and they want heavy duty opioids. And most of them now have a policy that they can't go into the clinic and get pain meds. They have to go in and have an appointment, see a doctor, explain the problem, and then they can prescribe them for the next day, but they don't just let them go in. And so of course they go in with their gun and uh, they've roamed the hospitals looking for this Dr. Terry Hunt, who's been very outspoken about this. And so they had the medical clinic in Buffalo, Minnesota that left one dead and four injured. First thing he said, first thing I assumed it's something to do with pain medication. So we have to ha ask in our own workplace, how safe are we? So gun, viol gun violence attacks are increasing and there's a constant problem with healthcare workers facing a challenge of assessing patients for the threats. And again, violence in healthcare settings happens every day on every shift in all areas of the hospital. I would say probably a fourth of the people that I go out and do assessments for, they have to postpone because they've been injured by a patient. And I just had one uh, two months ago, same thing. One guy had to have his shoulder repaired and operated on after uh, six foot, a six foot eight guy threw him down on the floor. So again, 95% of the nurses association in my safe Minnesota say they don't feel safe from violence at work. And so that's how you have to start looking at these things wherever you are. Why is this happening? Because revenue problems prevented hospitals from putting in the controls they needed. The hospital didn't want to spend money. It was too expensive. So they didn't do anything. Again, that it can't happen here keeps coming back. Some older administrators think of hospitals, clinics, and even schools as, as safe places, safe places you go to learn or to get care or to praise God or whatever, but they don't think about them as something. And they think that everybody has that same feeling and they don't. And also, I think a lot of C, uh, chief financial officer CFOs and controllers are not aware of the potential fines. In fact, we had a, a president of a big a medical company. And I tell him he was out of compliance with HIPAA. And he said, well, I didn't know that I could be fined. I didn't know that there was, he didn't know that there was anything they were going to do to him if he just didn't do it. And so he just didn't do it. And he said, well, what else am I out of compliance with? So I gave him like five more things that he was completely out of compliance with and about to get fined 
he had no idea. So sometimes it's talking to your management and explaining to them that there are penalties for now. It's illegal. It's a federal requirement. It's against the law. And these are required. It's not a choice. They don't say, if you feel like it could be dangerous, don't do it. It's, if, it's not a choice anymore. After they pass that CMS final rule on emergency preparedness, you have to be prepared. They don't give you a choice. So what a, could have prevented a lineup where a guy went in with, a, with homemade bombs he made in the Motel 6, 67-year-old guy, went in with his gun, with a bunch of ammunition, with his homemade bombs that he made in the Motel 6 where he was living, took the bus and he put it all in the suitcase, took a bus and went to this Alina clinic in Minnesota. And uh, again, he had done it so many times, they had a restraining order against him that they didn't enforce. They had no, they knew he wanted to blow them up. Again, pain med issue. And they could have had access control at the front door, but they didn't. They didn't have a security officer there. They had nobody. They could have set up a drive-by every day with the local police. They could have had panic alarms. They could have had a designated place of refuge for employees to go when they knew he was coming back. They didn't do any of these things. The only one, somebody who wants to blow you up and kill the doctor, the only way to prevent it is to have screening. If you don't do weapons, concealed weapons detection screening, you're going to have a horrible outcome. And of course, they had a horrible outcome. So these are some of the kind of controls that people, if I would ask this group, like, what do you think would help? Access control, panic alarms, active shooter policies and procedures, which some people don't even have now. It's a requirement to have. Uh, bomb threat, threat procedures, bulletproof glass, camera coverage of the area, active monitoring of the cameras. So that's what went wrong in Parkland. There was a 20 minute delay on the cameras. They thought that guy was still in there shooting when it left 20 minutes ago. But unless you have your cameras in, a, and they have to be out in a place where somebody can look at them immediately. You can't hear an explosion in the parking lot. A lot of these cameras, when I asked to see their monitoring cameras, they're locked up in the IT closet. And there's a deadbolt on the door. So you got to find the IT director if he's not at lunch and have him unlo uh, unlock that closet so you can go in and see what's on the monitor and what that crash was in the parking lot. Again, having plans, generators, incident response plans, all these different things, security on site, armed security, workplace violence program, they're all great, but they're not going to keep people out of your facility. So that's why I found and started talking to Athena about their concealed weapons screening program because it's very affordable and it keeps concealed weapons out. If somebody can reach on a gurney who's already been uh, brought in for mental health problems and is tied down and can still manage to keep her gun hidden and shoot it, there's something wrong with the way they're doing access control. And about 50% of these hospitals do no screening at all. They don't, they don't even, I mean, I'm not saying that they don't care. I'm sure they care, but they think it would look bad. That's why they don't do it because I've had people tell me, even after stunning assessments that show that how high the threat is where 95% of cities are safer than yours, they still don't wanna do screening because they feel like it'll make them look like they're unsafe. It's exactly the opposite. People who are smart, they, they, they feel good going in there because they know they're safe. Nobody's safe if you don't do this concealed weapon screening. So how do you show management? How do you justify that by spending the money into the control? And how do you show management the return on investment on a weapon screening program? Well, number one is a lot of places have pay a security officer to just sit in a chair by an x-ray all day and all night, 24 hours a day in a hospital. And, I've, and sometimes in schools too, during the school days, particularly somebody has to sit there all day. Well, if you have an automatic weapons, concealed weapons detection program, you don't have that problem. So we use this risk-based security risk assessment methodology that matches the OSHA work site, matches the CMS, everything. And the Defense Department began to require these be performed on high value facilities in 1998. And so that's when I moved to Washington DC in 1990 from California to do these kind of assessments and help them with it, to build their own methodology of a standardized methodology and what we're looking for is assets that are high value, they're very valuable, and they're critical to the functioning of the, operate, of the organization. So in a hospital, our high value assets are our people. They're our staff, they're the doctors, they're the biomedical equipment that's gonna take care of you during the operation. 
going to uh, administer the anesthetic, going to uh, keep people out of the operating room when an operation's in session. And these are the critical assets of the patients, right? And it's also currently required by every single uh, level of government, state, local, federal, cities, counties, everybody has to do these kind of assessments. Again, we look at the high value targets, how critical they are to the functioning of the organization. So what do we look what do, we, what do we look at when we're looking at a return on investment? Well, how much does a control cost to put in place? So a weapons screening program is a couple of thousand dollars a month, less than $2,000 a month, not very expensive. So what's the cost of maintaining that control over its life cycle? Because we don't want just the cost of, of purchasing it. We want what the cost is over time. So we can see, okay, it's good for three years before it would have to be updated. And maybe it costs $200 or $500 a year to update it with the latest uh, threat data and everything. So that means it's cost, say, $1,500 to put in place. It's protecting these high value, the, the lives of your staff and your patients and your students and your teachers and everybody and management. So what's the value of those things, life cycle of somebody? You know, it's how much it cost to replace them, which would be hundreds of thousands of dollars over three years. So I got a really high value asset, got a low cost control. How often would it be used? It'd be used a hundred thousand times, not a hundred thousand, maybe a maybe hundred times a day as everybody walks into the hospital. And so how, well, how often do we have something that would require, you know, some intervention? So this is where we go back and look at all this threat data that I'm going to talk to you about. And they would look at how likely it is for these different threats to occur. And then we take the cost of the control and we uh, do a ratio of be, it cost $1 to put it in place and it, it, it saves us $18,000 over its life cycle, $18,000 a year. So that's how we calculate the return on investment comparing the likelihood of the threat occurring. And again, we're gonna pick the, the threats that threaten the, the value of the organization where the, the people, patients, students, you know, that's the threat. What would cost to get it under control? $2,000, what would it save us? It could save us from a $2 million lawsuit, uh, uh, wrongful death lawsuit. So that's how we calculate this return on investment. So it doesn't take much because the long, wrongful death lawsuits are increasing so much They've already filed them. Every student in your Valdi, has already, the parents have already filed a wrongful death lawsuit for their children. And there'll be more for, for Tulsa and for the two doctors there. What's their value of their life and the income that they would have if they'd li lived and worked for another 20 years? So it gets up really fast and that's where you get the wrongful death idea. So it measures the cost of the control that you're thinking about based on the loss that you would suffer if it happened, if the asset was damaged or destroyed. And so that's why we want to do a return on investment calculation for how purchasing a concealed weapons detection system. So again, people always say to me, well, how do you value a human life? Well, we look at it just like we would a physical facility, like how much would the facility cost to replace if it was damaged by a tornado, for example. So for a person would use their salary per year until they're age 65 and the cost of replacing that employee at current rates, especially now, when nurses are in high demand, doctors are in high demand and there aren't enough, it doubles the value of those positions. Then we look at what threats could impact the personnel, that what could cause them to not to, to die or be injured, so, much, so injured that they couldn't work anymore. A workplace violence incident, injury or death, a disability that you know, could cause them to not be able to work as a nurse again, for example, an assault, a rape in the the fallout from that. So again, that's why we, we have to look at the likelihood of occurrence, meaning how much it happens in your zip code, how much it happens in your city, how much the IAHSS says it happens in healthcare, the FBI uniform crime rate for zip code, how often does it happen in your zip code, and all those things we aggregate together. In fact, you'll re the, everybody has to also fill out an OSHA 300 series report. And these are show what happens to employees over time. So one of them, for example, is 
I had a, a client where one of the employees hated the other one and they ran over their foot in the parking lot. So that goes to the, the OSHA 300 series. Uh, needle sticks, uh, just aggravation, again, rape, all those kind of things are all go into these 300 series reports, which are big, huge reports. And then we, val we take all these different values, combine them and average them by year to get a return on investment. So we also want to look at the cost of putting in the controls. So we want to show management that the cost of these is so low that it, 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 it's a responsible decision to put the control in place to offset the high threat and, and also the cost that, to the organization if something happens, the fine that they could have, either a fine or wrongful death lawsuit or both. So again, controls or safeguards, they're not just things like a concealed weapon detector. They're also actions like having, uh, like having, uh, badge, having people badged in, uh, having a plan put in place, you know, having training, those are actions. And then there's systems like the concealed weapon detection to eliminate, reduce, or mitigate any risk that could happen. And so again, this is a standardized thing that everybody uses now, the same thing, the cost of the controls, auditors call them safeguards, adding a concealed weapon detection system analyzed based on the total cost to the organization if the threat materializes and how much it'd save. So when we go in to do these assessments and I do them every week, we analyze all this different threat data that I've been collecting for 30 years. We identify how critical your assets are. So. And, and it has to be easy enough so you can go and do, give a presentation to the board. They're trying to push this responsibility to the board. So you're not just on a board because it looks good on your resume. You, you're, the board has to make decisions about things. And so this is a board level decision. In fact, in some of the uh, CMS reports that we do, they actually asked to see the board meetings where it said that they were gonna put this control in place. And then you can imagine if it's said in the board minutes, that they were gonna put this uh, control in place in the second quarter and they don't do it, then that's a problem because it's it said something and that was what it was supposed to be done. It didn't get done. So it doubles the fines or triples the fines if something happens. So it adds context to the assessment, including the, the dollar value of what securities they're protecting. Then we interview the staff. So we have automated web surveys we can send out to find out what people really think, how safe they feel there, what the kind of incidents they've experienced. We also can interview people on the phone. We can also do it on FaceTime. We can also do it in person. We can do it over Zoom. So we always have this measure of the staff compliance. Not in it's always, I can tell you, it's always different than what the staff member, than what the management thinks is going on. It's always worse. Fourth, we want to look at the implement, how much would it cost to implement these controls? How much would it cost? How much time would it take? And again, prepare action reports, say what we're going to do when we're going to do it. And the thing is, the sort of secret is, secret sauce of this is, if you have the return on investment to justify making this uh, expenditure, you don't have to do it all at once. So if I was going to recommend that you purchase uh, panic alarms for every hallway, in the school, every the entrance, every desk, every back door, every nurse's station. And I say, okay, because of our limited budget in next month, in the first quarter, we're going to buy four uh, panic alarms and hand them out. In the second quarter, we're going to buy four more. In the third quarter, we're going to buy four more. And then we're going to buy two more. So it's like 14 panic alarms altogether. But you have that, they will give you that leeway to to place these purchases out over time so you don't have to go and buy everything at once. What would you buy first? Access control, weapon screening. It's nice to have panic alarms in case somebody shows up on your floor with a gun, but why not pay for something that's gonna eliminate the chance of a gun stand, you know, showing up on your floor? So again, we pair action reports, what you're gonna do based on the requirements and the return on investment. So. Again, part of this is updating the emergency plan after you do the risk assessment. So take Yellowstone National Park in Montana, which is my favorite park. I go there and I love Montana. And so they've never had a flood since 1918. And today they had houses falling into the river and getting washed away. So that means that the risk assessment I did last year and the results of it are gonna be changed because of that. 
whether it's wildfires, whether it's a flood, whether it, whatever it is, it could be a man-made thing like active shooter incident, or it could be something net natural like nature, or it could be something like a chemical explosion. We had a chemical, when I worked in Baltimore, we had a chemical explosion of two train cars hitting together underneath the city in the tunnel, in the subway under the, under the city. But it was a real train, not a, not, a, not a subway thing. The train dipped down, went under the city and came up on the other side. And they had a huge chemical explosion there. So that's another thing, chemical explosion, man-made events. Miami, sea level rise, having condos just fall down out of the sky and, and collapse on each other, all the floors because of the environmental conditions. And also increases in local violent crime rate, increases in workplace violence injuries. We can track all these things. So when we go in to do a risk assessment, for example, then you can update them all based on the most current threat. And that also helps you decide what controls you can afford. So CMS requires also to you to invest in better communication system. So if there's an active shooter incident unfolding in the lobby and it's 10 to nine in the morning, you can instantly text everybody and tell them not to come in until further notice. You can also warn other all the other agencies instantly to come in and help out. And again, the penalties, these are just some samples of them. McDonald's was sued for $27 million and they won that lawsuit after two kids got killed in their parking lot. A uh, security company that didn't protect was $60, $64 million. And again, about 70% of active shooters come from termination situations. So the Kraft Cracker Factory in uh, Philadelphia, they fired a girl and she went out to her car and got her Glock and came back and and she shot the three people who fired her. Two of them were dead. One of them was in a wheelchair after that. And so, of course, they had a wrongful death suit against the company for $64 million. And they got the, they got the six, they had to pay the $64 million. Your security associates they don't exist anymore. They had to merge their assets in with another company to be able to pay this lawsuit. Stanford Health, even on the West Coast, $82 million lawsuit after a woman in the clinic got into her car, her Mercedes, nice heavy car, stepped on the gas instead of the brake, went right into the hospital and ran over the director of Lawrence Livermore Labs, killed her, $82 million lawsuit. Del, Del Nor Hospital Settlement, this is right outside of Chicago, four nurses received almost $8 million after they were traumatized and raped by a patient who was in the hospital, he was in a maximum security prison and he, he ate a plastic sandal like a crock. So he'd get really, really sick and he got really, really sick and moved to a hospital because he knows it's more, it's easier to escape from a hospital than it is a maximum security prison. So it had all, all this, these things happen. And again, their $8 million lawsuit, wrongful injury. So again, a, a reputation loss, like something in Parkland, it dropped the housing values 20% in one day when you had that shooting here. It, can, it, it affects the funding you get from the state and every hospital gets state funding. It creates millions of dollars in liability for the board if an incident occurs and it protects you too so that it makes it less likely for certain incidents to occur. And also you don't get fined because if you have an incident, you're not only gonna have to pay wrongful death lawsuits and fines, you're gonna get sanctioned, you're gonna get larger fine, monetary fines, it will protect you against all that if you have the can, can prove that you did your research, you identified this as a threat, and you put controls in place to protect against it. So this is just a return on investment, a quick look at cost to replace a staff member, wrongful death lawsuit, costs $3 million, total potential loss, cost of a concealed weapons detecting system on average $1,500, it's an $18,000 return on it, no, bigger. For every dollar you spend implementing the system, you save $18,000 by preventing all these other costs. So again, what we're doing here is creating a continuous cycle of improvement. Uh, we look at the assets that you have. We look at the threat data with the real threat numbers. We, we take the number of incident reports that happened at your location, what happened in similar locations, what the FBI crime rate is for your area, and we average them together. So we add them together, divide by three, and that gives your average for the year. For assault, it's like 12, seven times a year if we average these together. So I, based on this and the return on investment, I think that the 
the best solution to most security issues are having an entryway kind of program that looks at it maximizes the traffic flow so nobody has to stop it makes it has the ability to open doors electronically too you can get alerts on your phone so i was even out with a security guy one time to dinner and he got an alert on the phone saying a woman had just walked out and not the door didn't shut all the way he was able to use his phone call her in one minute she went back took her two minutes to go back and secure the door so you can see the alerts as they happen and uh our the co-founder of Athena, Lisa Falzon, people want a safe and secure world. Well, they don't want to, they want to avoid the feeling that they're going into a jail. So their new walk through metal detector has a fast flow of traffic in the facilities, has a higher level of concealed weapons detection, because it's the only one that complies with the federal requirement for metal detection, number one. Number two, it it alarms at more than just ferrous, which means iron, iron weapons like guns. It also looks at other kinds of weapons, but it knows the difference between a weapon and a cell phone. The molecules are arranged differently. Keys and watches, you don't have to take off your belt buckle to do this. So older metal detectors, you have to take all this stuff off. Here you don't. And it's a perfect solution to just walk through quickly. 3,000 people can go through in an hour, leave your backpack on, leave your headphones on, and it just walks right through. And there's a little command post there that is keeping track and video recording everything too. And it detects more concealed weapons than any other screening system. And we, we have the proof for that. So again, we're gonna look at the state of the control, see how valuable they are, see what the return on investment is. So for every dollar you spend adding to your security staff in this one, you save $15,000 by preventing a threat from occurring and causing damage. Bottom line, what we wanna do is save lives. We're gonna guarantee compliance with these requirements, reduce the organizational liability, prevent active shooter and workplace violence incidents before they happen by keeping weapons out of your facility. So you should, I'll send you a copy of this video. You can go in and show it to your management, talk to them about what you need to secure your facility, tell them what they do if they need screening. If you need help with the argument, let me know and I'll, I'll get on the phone or Zoom with you and we can work out a strategy for you. Again, explain lack of security. A judge actually said this, lack of security is not an effective legal argument after an active shooter event. So first we wanna analyze, we wanna fix that access control weakness so we can identify the concealed weapons and get them out of there. This is gonna ensure that you get the best bang for the buck. You can write me if you wanna discuss anything. I am look forward, I run to my email after every one of these webinars to see if somebody wrote me a note and said that, you know, they were, this happened to them, or they, they saw this, whatever it is. Also, you can send me, you can be my cub reporters and send me incidents that happened before I'm aware of them. So uh, this is my email address. I'm with Risk and Security LLC. Michael Green is on this call. He's the CEO of Athena Security. This is his email address. And if you have questions about their entryway system, of course, you can do that. And we're here in Parkland, hopefully waiting for not another shooter incident to happen. So does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? If you can uh, send me a chat message if you'd like to, or you can contact me later. Any questions?